by one of my favorite worship leaders, I believe, Matt Papa. You may have not heard of Matt, but he teaches at Southeastern Seminary, our Baptist Theological Center, Seminary in Wake Forest. Very, very gifted man. Tonight I want to talk to you about uh, Under Armour, God's Armour, as we talk about the second part of the armor and getting ready for battle, part two. And uh, I just want to dive in. I uh, don't want to waste any of your time, but just want to dive into this text and get looking at it for a few minutes. Chuck Lawless said this. He says, warfare is the devil's attempt to deceive and divide believers. That's what he wants to do. He wants to deceive and divide the believers. Now, these are some of Paul's last words. These are his last words here pretty much in the book of Ephesus. And he's talking to them about spiritual warfare. Now remember, Ephesus was very big in the occult. They had uh, temples to over 50 gods. They were very spiritualistic. They thought about the spiritual world all the time. And say so they really believed in the spiritual world. You need to understand our Lord Jesus Christ believed in demonic powers too. And the Apostle Paul did too. Jesus cast out many demons. And if he didn't believe in demons, he wouldn't have done that. And so he's telling us there is a war out there and there is a battle out there. And so let's go read this passage tonight. We're going to just read all of it in case you missed last Week And so let's read this whole text here, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. It says, Finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the darkness, of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And remember, the evil day is, is just the time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming, okay? And having prepared everything to take your, don't miss this word, stand, key word. Then he says, stand, don't miss that. He didn't say sit, he didn't say lie down, he didn't say be a couch potato, he said stand. Therefore, with truth, like a belt around your waist, righteousness like an armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with a readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take the shield of faith, and with it you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word, and with every prayer and request, pray at all times, in the spirit, not in the flesh. And stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me, he says, that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known the boldness, with boldness, the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador, he's in prison, in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough in him to speak as I should. And so... Paul is talking about the armor here. Now remember, we, we gave you these imperatives. Uh, the first one is be strengthened. And where do we get our strength? In the Lord, right? Then he says uh, in verse 10, he says what? Put on the half armor of God. No, the full armor of God. Okay? He says, put it on. And then he says, take up the armor of God, right? You need to take up the armor of God. And so you've got to take up the armor of God. And it's very important that you and I do that. Now there's two other imperatives in this text here that you need to understand. Uh, verse 14, he kicks off verse 14 here with uh, one word. And he says, stand. Stand. And it's an imperative of what we're to do. 
Stand not in our strength, but stand in the full armor of God is what we need to be uh, standing in. And then in verse 17, the other one is, is take. Because he says here, he says, take the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit. See, those are two key words. you got to take the helmet of salvation and you got to take the sword of the Spirit. And so you got to understand these are five key imperatives that Paul has in this text that are telling us how to live in the armor of God, how to be equipped and ready for battle. you got to be strengthened in the Lord. You try to do this in your might, you're going to get kicked to the curb tomorrow morning as quick as possible. You better put on the full armor of God. You got to take up the armor of God. You say, how do I do that? I'll give that to you then, okay? You got to stand in the armor of God and you got to take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. And so it's very important. So just give you a recap, and he's got it already up there for you. We need the Lord's strength. We need to put on the full armor of God, and you need to know our enemy. We need to know our enemy. And you need to know this the devil is scheming against us. So what the text says, he is, uh, our battle is spiritual. It's not against humans. We think it is, but it's against, verse 12, <laughs> uh, it's against evil. It's against darkness. And we need to stand in the evil day. Now, the main idea of this text is this, to remind you, is that we need to stand firm in the midst of spiritual warfare by wearing God's armor. How are you going to do this? You're going to stand in the armor of God. See, the armor is applying the gospel. What, God, what Paul has been preaching throughout this whole book is the gospel and how we, it changes your life. And now that you're in Christ, now how it affects your life and how we're to wear that on a daily basis. And the only way you and I will do that is through God's grace and God's strength. Because we've all done it and we could have a long testimony time of how we've not done it in the armor and did it in our strength. And one night we might do that. So your children and grandchildren might realize, don't go down that path, Amen. but go down this path. See, you need to understand, since the fall in Genesis 3, the devil has been trying to bait us with false teaching to lure us into sin, to turn us against one another, to keep us from glorifying God so that we can no longer care about people. J.D. J. D. Greer said this. He says, the enemy wants to... Mess us up. Fall into sin. He wants us to give up. If he doesn't get you with sin, he wants you to get discouraged, depressed, defeated. If that doesn't work, he wants you to get puffed up. In arrogance and think that you're all that in a bag of chips. If that doesn't work, he wants you to split up. That's what he does with churches. He gets them to divide. And they split, and then these go over here, and they got mad. That's why you got Baptist, and then New Hope Baptist, and then Second Hope Baptist, and then you got one way out in the county, it's Last Hope Baptist. <laughs> because they just got mad, and then they moved on, and then they moved on, and they moved on. So that's the devil. And then you know what he wants you to do? Then he wants to shut you up. What's that? He wants you to quit caring about people that are lost and quit evangelizing and quit sharing your testimony. See, that's what the devil wants to do. So you and I need to know about the armor, and we need to know how to put on the armor, and we need to understand what the armor is. And so let me give you these seven pieces of armor. Now, some people say six, some say seven. I'm going with seven tonight, okay? Seven's perfect number, so completeness, wholeness, we'll go with seven, okay? And I don't, it, it doesn't matter when you... After I share them with you, it doesn't matter. I can go with six or seven because the seventh one you're going to need anyway. So, number one, right there in the text, you need the belt of truth. The belt of truth. See, the, uh, the uh, Roman soldier wore a belt is about eight inches wide. It's more like kind of a weightlifter's belt that we would know. And it would give support to back, and it would give support in the front. So if someone punched them in the stomach, you know, it was there. Also, the belt... You needed the belt. You know why? 
it held the sword. You need a belt. Or your pants will fall down and you get in trouble. And you got pants on the ground. And that's how we live. I think you get the picture, but that's how many days we go out in this world. Serious. That's all. Uh, serious. That's how we go out. No belt of truth. And when you have no belt of truth, you got no sword. And it's not going to be pretty. See, the belt was the last piece of equipment that a soldier would put on. Because then it would, it would, everything else that they were wearing, the tunic and all the pieces, they would enclose it with that belt and they would cinch it with that belt. I mean, you don't want, if you're going to war, you don't want stuff flapping out there. You wouldn't want that. So you're going to cinch it all up in what? Truth. You don't want to go battle like this, have to pull your pants up all the time, what's going to happen? You're going to get killed. See, truth is a very important part of this book of Ephesians. And see, if we're not strengthened by God's word, you know what happens? We buy into the lies of the father of all lies, who is the devil. He's the enemy. If you don't put on the belt of truth, he's like, man, I got them today. Watch this. I'm, watch this. Just, you just watch this. They're going to have pants on the ground in a minute. So you need to be teachable. That's the importance. Because you have the truth, you're teachable, and say, hey, I need this belt of truth. You need to understand, Satan fights with lies, and he's very good at it. What if you got 99% truth? Is that truth? Why? Because you got to have what? You got to have, that means 1% is a lie. Oh, the devil is very, very good at this. So, how? Gosh, I've heard this one. God wants me to be happy, Pastor. You smoking something. God doesn't want you to be happy. Apostle Paul wasn't happy. Joy is something different. Jesus wants you to be holy, not happy. See, the enemy will deceive you, and he'll make the truth sound the truth sound like it's the real deal when it's all a lie. And he's been doing it. <laughs> you need to understand, he's, he's crafty. He's been doing it since Genesis 3. And just don't think you're going to walk out there and kick him to the curb on your own strength. It ain't happening. You better have the Word of God. You better apply the Word of God. You better be devoted to the Word of God. You better get in the Word of God. And if you don't, you will neglect the Word of God. And if, that, if you don't do that, hey, the devil's going to get you. So you need to have the belt of truth. Second, you better have the breastplate of righteousness. Now this breastplate was a metal uh, or... or it, and it had layer leather, and it would cover the heart, the chest, the neck, and the abdomen from attack. And it also would protect uh, them in the back of the soldier. Now, why did they need this? I mean, because they were getting assaulted. No soldier would think, hey, I'm going into battle without my breastplate. Uh-uh. Just like no police officer is going to go into a... You know, you know, you know, you're fixing to go into, you know, a threatening situation. You're going to have on your, your Kevlar. <laughs> your, <laughs> you want that armor on. <laughs> you want to be protected, for sure. See, Paul got this imagery from Isaiah 59, 17, where it says he put on righteousness as a breastplate. Breastplate. He says in Ephesians 4, 1, he says, hey, in, in a couple times, he says, hey, man, you're to live a life worthy of this calling that God has called you. See, we need to put on 
The breastplate of righteousness. And how we do that? By living a life obedient to Christ. See, we don't need to give an inch to Satan. We've already given him enough inches and yards and feet. And that's why you need a breastplate on so that you might live a clean and obedient life. That's why you've got to saturate your life in obedience to God. If not, Satan will literally hammer you good. Because if you have nothing to protect your chest, your heart, your lungs, your abdomen, man, he's coming straight for the kill. And that's what he'll do. And you know why sometimes it happens? <laughs> Is we're not willing to allow Jesus to have total control. So what are you saying? <laughs> Satan knows where our weak spots are. Your weak spot's different than my weak spot. Your strength might be my weakness. My strength might be your weakness. The devil knows that. And he's going to hit on it. It can be from finances to dating to any whatever other situation you want to come up with from A to Z. It doesn't matter. If you don't give God control in it, or if you've got a habit that you're dealing with and you haven't given it to the Lord, you know what the devil's going to do? Bam, bam, bam. And if you don't get covered in the breastplate of righteousness, you don't have a hope and a prayer. Because you better be covered in his righteousness. See, the only thing that's going to get you to heaven is a relationship with Jesus Christ and being covered in his blood and righteousness. But see, you need his righteousness for the rest of your life. See, again, we've allowed this, that stinking thinking that get saved and get baptized and that's all you need. And that's been very prevalent in our churches, sad to say. And with that thinking, oh gosh. Devil's girl, he loves that. Because he's just going to keep every one of them defeated, discouraged, depressed. And every other D word that you can think of. And so that's why you need the breastplate. Number three, you need the gospel shoes. Gospel shoes. He says there's readiness. You need preparation. You need to have firm footing. Now, in ancient Roman Empire, they would have open-toed leather boots with thick, nailed, studded soles, that, and they would literally tie them around their ankles and, and uh, shins. Now, these weren't really running shoes, but they were used to travel great distances. These, these soldiers could cover a large part of ground and very fast time, but what had happened is it was very good uh, cleats. Now, we know football cleats. They're kind of for traction. These cleats that these soldiers would have would, would help them if they were in soft ground. It would help them to stand firm to where then they could do the hand-to-hand -hand battle because if they were in soft, term, soft ground and you don't, don't have good cleats, you don't have those thick, nail-studded shoes, what is going to happen? You're going to slide. What is he saying? Man, you and I need to be prepared in the gospel. So what he's saying, you need to be prepared in the gospel. What is he saying? You need to have a firm grasp on the gospel. Why? Because it's what's changed your life. Robbie Gowdy said this, we have rest for our restless souls when our souls are grounded in the peace of Christ. See, man, once you give your life to Christ, you have peace with God. But then now what you can have every day is the peace of God. And so how, what do we need to have the peace of God about? It's so that we can have gospel conversations with other people that don't know Jesus Christ. See, see, part of this is being having on strapped on these shoes so we know how to have a battle and how to share the gospel with somebody. See, the problem is most of the time we have no gospel shoes, so we slide down the hill and we don't really care about anybody and we buy in the thing we don't need to talk about Jesus and we don't need to tell anybody about Jesus because we bought into what the devil said. I don't have the gift of evangelism. None of us have the gift of evangelism. You got the office of an evangelist. 
who's gifted for the equipping of the saints. See, our footing needs to be firm in the gospel. You say, I don't know how to share the gospel. Share your testimony, praise God. You say, you don't know how to share the gospel? Then you don't listen to me preach every, every Sunday. I will share the gospel, and if you will listen, you will catch the gospel by osmosis and know how to share it. I'm serious. You say, what are you talking about? I shared it today. A disciple must be saved. How do you be saved? you got to believe the gospel. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, when I start doing that, I'm sharing the gospel. Believe, repent, receive, call on, now follow me. You can do that. I've been doing that for three years. I do the same prayer at the end of my sermon. You know why? Where if you might listen, you might be able to lead somebody to the Lord too. See, I just don't do that haphazardly. See, that's intentionally trying to even disciple you in the middle of a sermon so that you might know how to share with someone how their lives can be changed by the power of the gospel. And I'm telling you, if you ever get a chance to share the gospel with someone and then you see them give their life to Christ, you won't be the same. See, that's the problem in most of our churches. You think, that's what the pastors do. Man, I love it. But I want you to experience it. Because I know you won't be the same. Because you're going to like, wow, I don't believe that. They just gave their life to Christ. I didn't think I shared anything worth a flip. I, and they decided they wanted to pray and give their life to Christ. And now they're going to church. They got baptized. And now their family's going, man, that's going to change your life. That's why we need to be shod with the gospel of peace. See, we don't want that. I don't want those shoes. You need to be shod with it. Number four, shield of faith. You need that. This shield was used to protect the body, the heart, the lungs, and all the vital organs. It was four feet in length and about a a foot and a half in width, maybe two feet wide. So you got four feet by two feet. Pretty good sized shield. It was composed of two leathers, uh, two layers. It had laminated wood bound on the uh, bound top and bottom with iron, and then it was. It was covered with reinforced leather. Okay? So it's covered with its leather. And then what it, was, it, what it was designed to do was protect the soldier from arrows, flaming arrows, that were hurled at them. And see, what they would do is, is they would soak those in water. So when the flaming arrow would come over, it would hit that leather soaked in water. And put it out. And so with that shield, you've already got the head and everything else. you got full protection from head to toe. See, we need that. Why? Or you just, you don't know, the devil throws these darts at us all the time. From depression to discouragement to, to deception to lies to temptation. Hey, that's why we need them. See, what the Roman army would do back then... As they, as they would walk toward their uh, enemy, all of a sudden they would get up far enough and then they would put their shields all together. And then what they would do is they'd have their guys, the other guys, the rest of the army back there with their flaming arrows and then they would shoot them over at the enemy. See, they would walk up like this and then eventually they would all get close enough and they would all put their shields down and they're protected, and then the other ones behind them 
would send in the arrows and hit the enemy. See, as a church, that's the importance of the armor. Just think if we, we all started walking more with a shield of faith. We might be able to take some steps and expose darkness and see people's lives change because we're walking by faith and we're able to extinguish the arrows of the evil one. Instead, instead we're like Jonah and we're running and hiding. Because we're scared of culture. We're scared of evil. When we do have the armor. See, I mean, they, they knew how to do it back then. They would literally, they would wrap those arrows. They were flammable material. They would dip them in pitch and then set them on fire. For the whole purpose of man setting that enemy on fire. But praise God, they'd have that, that shield there and it would just hit that and down it goes. That's why we need that shield of faith bad. Because the devil wants you to doubt. And see, again, this, that's the importance of being in a life group, folks. Because <laughs> if you get more of you wearing the shield of faith and you start praying for one another and then you start serving with one another and you get on mission with God and you're walking with those armors and you start going out, you're going to make a dent in darkness for the kingdom of God. Will that be easy? God didn't promise us easy. That's another lie of the devil. God didn't say my life would be comfortable. He said there'd be tribulation. In fact, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 12, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, Satan will say, have it easy. God says in the scripture, we'll be persecuted. That's why we need the armor. Number five, you better put on a helmet of salvation. Man, they had a, that helmet. It was made out of bronze and iron. Now, to make it more comfortable, they would put a cloth in there. They didn't have nice uh, football helmets with all the cushion in there that they got them in now. Uh, man, they... They had a big helmet. It would cover the back of their neck. It would cover their head. And it protected them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And he said here, take the helmet of salvation. What are you saying? He's saying, put it on. And every day we need to thank God. Hey, man, I am saved. I'm a child of God. And put that helmet on and walk out into this world and live for Jesus. That word take means to accept it. Man, just like a soldier, man, you go, you get, go in the army, you go in the military, they give, you go into battle, they're going to give you that helmet. You better put on that helmet. You better put it on. It's just like if you're going to play football out there on the field, you better put on a helmet. And it's amazing. This is a sidebar. This is a funny note. It's amazing how many stupid... Up Many of them stupidly will take off their helmet and then start fighting. Amen. I'm like, keep your helmet on. What happens when we take our helmet off? Our head is exposed. It only takes one shot. You're down for the count and out. That's what the devil wants you to do. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 10, 5, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. See, what's in our mind here? Our head is our mind, and that's where the battle takes place every day. And if you don't have on the helmet of salvation, 
you're going to go the way of the flesh, devil, and the world. Number six. Trying to wrap up. Sword of the Spirit. This is the first offensive weapon. All those are defensive. Amen. We're, we're getting protection. Okay, now we're protected from head to toe. Now, this was a short dagger or sword that they would use in battle, maybe two to three feet long, depending. And so, remember, it was tied to the belt of truth. Now, what does the text say that the sword of the Spirit is? What does it say? Yeah, it's the Word of God. So you need to know the Word of God, right? Because if you don't know the Word of God, you don't have a, a sword. And you need that. See, back then, a blacksmith would heat the iron on the sword and cover the red-hot iron with some coal dust to make it where it would be strengthened, and man, it would be able to be used very good when it came to the enemy. You need to know the word. Why? It's sharper than any two-edged sword. <laughs> it's living and powerful and active. Amen. It can discern the intents and thoughts of your heart. It's powerful. It can send the enemy reeling for a time. Why? Jesus used it. That's why you need to know the Word of God. That's why you need to read the Word of God. You need to study the Word of God. You need to trust the Word of God. You need to memorize the Word of God. You need to meditate on the Word of God so you don't misunderstand the Word of God. Why? Because the devil is going to give you a lot of lies. And if you don't know the Word of God, you're going to buy into the lie of the devil, and now you're going to walk right into enemy camp, and you're going to get kicked to the curb and become one of the enemy's Nice big fish that he mounts on the wall. So you got to have the word. It's about you keep harping on the word, yeah? Because it's God's. <laughs> this is don't sit on the coffee table to gather dust. It's somewhere to read and apply. He didn't give us this just so we could look at Oh, wow, that's pretty nice. It's something to read, and God speaks to us, and then we live it, and we apply it. So those are the six. Now, people debate on this next one, and it doesn't matter. The seventh one is prayer. Either you put them on and pray, or you view prayer as one. It doesn't matter, okay? So it doesn't matter. So 18 through 20, if you read that text, it says, Pray at all times with all or every prayer, all per perseverance, all the saints. He said, man, we need to be praying. And I think we need to pray on the armor of God. And he says, pray at all times. So that, what does that mean? We don't have to be in a church building. We don't, we don't have to be in a prayer closet. That means we can pray anytime, anywhere. And many times, if you, walk, if you realize tomorrow morning you walk out in the world, you walk to school and you realize I haven't prayed, you better start praying and say, Lord, I want to put on this armor. Lord, I want to be covered. I don't want to give, I don't want to give in to the devil. I don't want to give in to anything. Lord, I want to be yours today. So you need to realize it's about praying, and you better pray and put it on. See, praying in the Spirit is not talking in tongues or anything. It's about praying in harmony with the will of God. Saying, Lord, I am dependent upon you. I'm dependent upon your Spirit. Lord, give me confidence to walk in your love and in your word. And may you release your power in me. And I'm just going to tell you this. You know the passage, some of you. If you've been in church a while, you know this passage. James says you have not because you ask not. not. You need to understand, it's a war. And you need to understand, it's not going to get any easier, folks. It's not going to get any easier. The only one, it's not. Period. It's not. You're like, maybe to go back, wait, it was 50, 60 years ago. It's not going there. There's no more day you put a sign out, say, church, y'all come, and they come. It ain't happening no more, folks. See, we bought in the lie of the devil many years ago and thought we don't really need to stand up for the word, and we allowed liberal heretics, and we allowed a bunch of liberalism and a bunch of other junk to slip in our churches, and we haven't stood up for the word of God, and we haven't put on the armor, and we've allowed him to come in and sit in our pews and reign in our churches because we haven't been armed and ready for battle because we've been a bunch of wimps with a yellow streak from one top of our head to the bottom of our toe. 
And we've all done that. You just got to understand, this is a battle. But in him, you gain the strength. And it's his armor. And with that, you're already victorious. Because you gave your life to Christ. And this is how you live in victory with Christ. So he says here, be consistent, be alert, be intense in your prayer. Let me wrap this up. So how do I do this? So how do I do this? I'm just going to kind of give you how I do it. My way is not perfect way. My way is my way. Does that make sense? You find your own way. It's your prayer time, not my prayer time. Does that make sense? So you just got to say, Lord, I want to put on your armor today. Lord, have me put on your belt of truth. Joshua 1, 8 says, This book of law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Say, hey, Lord, may your truth rule in my heart, be in my mind, and on my lips. Lord, help me put on the breastplate of righteousness. Lord, may I not defile you today. Lord, I want to refuse to look anything wicked, worthless, vile, or vulgar. Psalm 101, verse 3. Lord, I want to make a covenant with my eyes. I only want to see what you want me to see. And if you're married, I only have eyes for my wife. That's more for guys. See, apart from you, Lord, there is no righteousness. Lord, I praise you that I am born again. But Lord, help me to wear your righteousness today against all condemnation, against all assaults. Lord, fit me with your holiness, with your purity. Defend me against all the assaults to my heart. Lord, help me put on the gospel cleats. May I reflect your gospel in my words, my actions. That through me, every, every person that encounters me, others may be take one step closer to you. Lord, help me to invite and invest. Lord, give me your heart for lost people. Lord, help me put on the shield of faith. May I take you at your word. Help me to walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, help me to see you, and then help me to see the way of escape in temptation. Because you're going to get tempted just like I get tempted. And God says there will always be a way of escape. Lord, help me put on the helmet of salvation. Lord, I thank you that you've saved me, you've redeemed me, you've bought me. But Lord, help me take every thought captive to your obedience. Lord, let no corrupt communication come out of my mouth. But what is necessary for edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. And keep watch over the door of my lips. Help me to say no to, un, no to all ungodliness, worldly passions. And help me live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life. Lord, help me to use your sword of spirit. May your Holy Spirit bring those, those verses to my mind just when I need them. Show me specifically the truths of the Word of God that I need so that I can encounter the snares and the arrows of the enemy. So that's why you need to memorize God's Word. And then, Lord, I pray you'd fill me with your Spirit. Help me to walk by your Spirit, to be led by your Spirit, Live in tune with your spirit. See, the great thing about today, soldiers, they have the luxury of fighting with the advantage of aerial surveillance. That's amazing what surveillance can see today. They can tell whether people are in that building and they know, you know, it, it's just amazing. Those of you who are in the military, been in the military, it's amazing. 
You need to understand, folks, we have surveillance too. And you know what it is? It's the blessing of direct communication with God the Father. And you can talk to Him through spiritual warfare. And many times if we would talk to Him, He might tell us the enemies around the corner. How do we do that? We've got to stay connected to Him. Pray. Be strengthened in the Lord. Put on the full armor of God. Take up that armor. Stand. Take them. Put them on. Pray them on. And live in God's power and God's spirit. And you'll have victory in Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do love you and we do praise you. We thank you so much for your grace, your mercy, and your love. Lord, we come to this topic. Lord, we all could say in this room,